My brothers and sisters, we've been through so much, seen so much, and felt so much. But even though the road ahead may look rocky, let us all remember that we are survivors. Yes, I'm a Sierra Leonean, a true Sierra Leonean. Yes, I've gone through war, and I survived. Yes, I've gone through pain, I've gone through shame, but I'm a survivor, so I survived. Now there is Ebola, threatening my nation, a silent killer, with a mean spirit, to break us apart, to keep us apart. But we are survivors, so we will survive. We gotta dance together, dance together. Oh, he's alive. We gotta rock together, rock together. Oh, he's alive. We gotta sing together, sing together. Oh, he's alive. We gotta laugh together, love each other. Oh, he's alive. I help you, you help me. Oh, he's alive. He helps her, she helps him. Oh, he's alive. We gotta dance together, dance together. Oh, Rock together, oh he's alive. We gotta sing together, sing together, oh he's alive. We gotta laugh together, love each other, oh he's alive. We gotta kick Ebola, kick Ebola, oh he's alive. We gotta fight Ebola, fight Ebola, oh he's alive. Oh sweet mama Salon, we still have hope. And once the sun they rise, Salon will rise again. My brothers and sisters, we've been through so much, seen so much, and felt so much. But even though the road ahead may look rocky, let us all remember that we are survivors. Yes, I'm a Sierra Leonean, a true Sierra Leonean. Yes, I've gone through war, and I survived. Yes, I've gone through pain, I've gone through shame, but I'm a survivor, so I survived. Now there is Ebola, threatening my nation, a silent killer, with a mean spirit, to break us apart, to keep us apart. But we are survivors, so we will survive. We gotta dance together, dance together. Oh, he's alive. We gotta rock together, rock together. Oh, he's alive. We gotta sing together, sing together. Oh, he's alive. We gotta laugh together, love each other. Oh, he's alive. I help you, you help me. Oh, he's alive. He helps her. Sing together, sing together. Oh, he's alive. We gotta laugh together, love each other. Oh, he's alive. We gotta kick Ebola, kick Ebola. Oh, he's alive. We gotta fight Ebola, fight Ebola. Oh, he's alive. Oh, sweet mama Salon, we still have hope. And once the sun they rise, Salon will rise again. Hope is still alive. My brothers and sisters, we've been through so much, seen so much, and felt so much. But even though the road ahead may look rocky, let us all remember that we are survivors. Yes, I'm a Sierra Leonean, a true... The mic's not on. Oh, there we go. Okay. 
Welcome. Oh, my goodness. Does everybody feel good? Yes. yes, because there's the flu going on, so I just want to be sure everybody feels good. And we are addressing issues like infectious diseases that is happening right now all over the world. So this is an extremely important event. Welcome all of you in this room for caring about this issue. Welcome to all those who are watching on the webcast, including those from West Africa, all our friends that we're here to honor and to pay tribute to for their being such heroes, for surviving Ebola, and all the others who are going through all these terrible infectious diseases that are plaguing our, our country and our world. So this is a sign that a family was holding on Lumley Beach in Freetown, Sierra Leone, when I was there, and gave it to me, and it says, Fatima, what does it say? There we go. Fatima will be on the panel from WHO, who knows a lot about Ebola. <clears throat> I am African. I am not a virus. So many people held up this sign as part of a public relations campaign uh, and what does it mean that all those people were stigmatized uh, by this infectious, horrific disease that claimed the lives and livelihood of so many people? Uh, that stigma was only one part of the horrible plague, the economic disaster, uh, the social disintegration for the fragile states that were already struggling uh, to advance uh, their situation. So we're here to really raise awareness about that, to continue to pay attention to this very important issue. And thank you so much to the mission of Sierra Leone. Uh, Ambassador Karoma is here, uh, who organized this event with us. And it is such an, a crucial issue. So many of you uh, who are going to speak will pay, uh, will explain much further about that. The theme is, uh, the triumvirate of Sustainable Development Goals 1, 4, and 3. I direct your attention to the slide over there that, thank you, Matthew and I made, to show that there is a holistic approach here to the Sustainable Development Goals between eradicating poverty, quality education, number four, eradicating no poverty, number one, and three, health, good health and well-being, and particularly as a psychologist, I'm very um, fond of this, that this is in the Sustainable Development Goals, so SDG Target 3.4, which includes um, not just NCDs, but also promote mental health and well-being because so many people are still suffering even two years later. Uh, and that is what we are here to really address. I'm Dr. Judy Kuriansky. I'll be uh, the moderator for uh, today, I'm very honored to do so, having been to Sierra Leone many times um, about the AIDS uh, epidemic and then during Ebola um, and then afterwards as well. As well. So there, uh, this triumvirate, this connection, this circular connection um, is the theme of today and it addresses the title that you see of our uh, side event here for the Commission for Social Development. Achieving Poverty Eradication by Sustainable Health, Well-Being, and Education in the Case of Ebola in West Africa and Other Epidemics and Infections Diseases Worldwide. So you are going to hear from a very distinguished group of ambassadors, permanent representatives, DPRs, uh, minister counselors from countries uh, in various regions around the world who all stepped up to the plate and really contributed to the emergency that was uh, so tragic. So you will hear from them. You will also hear from civil society and NGOs, people who are on the ground now, even working towards the ongoing recovery, which is so important. You'll hear from WHO and UNICEF. Um, and then, of course, we want to hear from you. Uh, to set the stage for our discussion, um, I'd like to go to a videotape that you'll see um, about the situation 
of Ebola during and then right after with a focus on uh, mental health and psychosocial support and also the economic and social disaster that was going on. I've gone through a lot. I lost nine of my family, my mother, my wife, my brothers and sisters. All of them died. Memories of those dead bodies, you know, cause fear to us. I face something, this stigma in the community. The Ebola epidemic hit West Africa hard in March 2014. And schools were shut, streets, businesses, and beaches became bare. Curfews and the ABC rule to avoid body contact restricted touching, especially dead bodies. Fear, stigma, myths. People were um, actually attributing the many deaths to a witch plane. Loss and unfathomable trauma spread as fast as the virus. We're all connected, right? To address such threats in mental health and well-being, I went to Sierra Leone to help provide psychosocial support, as I'd done after many disasters worldwide. We conducted trainings and workshops for children, communities, burial teams, healthcare workers, and many groups. Nearly a year later, by November of 2015, when I returned to the country, now Ebola-free, it looked like a new world. With bustling streets, busy stalls, packed buses, weddings, people hugging with the ban on touch lifted, schools reopened, I want a big doctor. and beaches packed with people. Life looks like it's back to normal on the outside, but it's not the same story on the inside. Don't know where to sleep, even to eat. People stigmatize us. Some of my friends, like uh, for instance, they run away from me. I'm out of the job. We don't have place to live. We are in the streets right now. My side is aching, my stomach, you know, my head. The women, they lost their husbands. Yeah. They say, well, look, you are, you are still having the virus in your system, so I cannot accept you anymore. Research proves psychological problems are long-lasting after crisis. It's the reason why my colleagues and I raised consciousness about the psychosocial issues in Ebola at this panel at the United Nations, organized by Voices of African Mothers, and at this forum at the UN in December 2014 that I co-organized in my role as chair of the Psychology Coalition with sponsorship and panelists from many missions to the United Nations, as well as NGOs and UN agencies like UNICEF and WHO. All that inspired my trip to the Ebola stricken region to help build resilience and capacity <laughs> to counteract hopelessness from the drastic disease my songwriting partners and I wrote a theme song about hope hope yes but the mental health and psychosocial needs in the region are drastic in these um, countries all of them had less than one psychiatrist per one million population they were psychologically traumatized after the war and then during the course of Ebola. The importance and the impact of mental health here in Sierra Leone is evident at this conference. The theme of this mental health conference is the popular phrase, building back better. Local presenters joined international experts who came from countries like the UK, Spain, the Netherlands, and the US to present their work in many partnerships with local Sierra Leoneans. Support for recovery is happening for survivors in this network supported by the government. We educate people, we render some um, psychosocial support. For community members affected by Ebola, welcome back as shown in the plays like this one. And for youth, in programs like this one founded by a former burial team member, in these workshops I co-developed for children's resilience being rolled out, and this camp supported by the First Lady of Sierra Leone and UNFPA to teach girls about issues like climate change, waste management, and self-esteem. I'm brilliant. I'm smart. I can change the world. Celebrating heroes. It's a major theme in Ebola recovery. Ebola survivors are heroes. Government officials who stepped up to the plate are heroes. I quarantine homes in the absence of medical teams coming in. All responders, helpers, and the people are heroes. You did an amazing thing for everybody and for your country. Despite advances, there is much to be done and many needs. What we look for from the government's part 
is to also make the necessary changes in the national constitution that discriminates and stigmatizes against people who are mentally ill. We need counseling. We need medical support. The money is not enough for us. I'm asking you guys for you to support these orphans in the schools. But ultimately, hope is alive. You love me. I love you. Hope is alive. What we are survivors, so we, we will survive. survive. <laughs> Love together, hope is Yes, I'm a Sierra Leonean. A true Sierra Leonean. Yes, I've gone through war. And I survive. Yes, I've gone through pain. Hope is alive. Hope is Alive, you heard that song sung by many groups uh, on the ground in Sierra Leone. Uh, it was written by myself and Russell Daisy, who you see right here, Yotam Policer from Israel, who was also on the ground, and Emrys Savage, who is a Sierra Leonean. It really is the word that encapsulates what's so important and what we're here for to keep the people's hope that we really still care about them. It's the word, by the way, that was said a great deal during the donor conference after the terrible hurricanes. And Ambassador Beckless is over there uh, from Trinidad and Tobago, certainly knows about that because that's her, her region. So hope is really critical uh, in this. And it is exactly what I saw Ambassador Amadou Karoma give to the children who were part of the diaspora in Staten Island when Russell and I and, and Ambassador Karoma went to the celebration of Independence Day of Sierra Leone, he came, gave a speech to the diaspora there to reassure them and worked with the children. And what he said to the children, oh, what's going on here? Hello? What he said to the children was truly inspirational. He told them to continue their education which is, of course, part of our circle there, and to respect their elders and to feel good about themselves because those kids were being stigmatized in school. They were being told that they should leave the class because they spread, they're spreading the virus. They went home and they cried. And he stood there with all of them. They were captivated by his inspiring, sen his inspiring sentences. So I give the floor to Ambassador Karoma. Well, first of, first of all, I want to um, say that um, I am here representing the PR of Sierra Leone, um, Ambassador Adikali Fodisuma, who will have loved to be here to participate in this very important uh, event, but is in Addis Ababa um, attending the annual African Union Summit. So, for starters, let me make a very short um, statement. Um, the, also, the Minister of um, Social Welfare, Gender and Children's Affairs, will have also love to be here, but unfortunately, she's not able to make it. So, I'll be also be making a very short statement uh, on her behalf. Um, Madam Moderator, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you all to this important event organized by the Permanent Mission of Sierra Leone together with the Permanent Missions of Botswana, Canada, China, Cuba, France, Germany, Guinea, Morocco, and international organizations accredited to the United Nations such as the World Health Organization, UNICEF, the International Association of Applied Psychologists, and uh, members of the Psychology Coalition of NGOs, as well as, of course, our distinguished uh, panelists, who we are going to hear from shortly. But also, let me thank especially Dr. Judy for the uh, untiring effort, uh, for all the time and energy she has put uh, in helping us uh, organize this event. Thank you so much. 
This event entitled Achieving Poverty Eradication by Sustainable Health, Wellbeing and Education, the case of Ebola in West Africa and other epidemics and disasters worldwide, is intended to sustain the momentum of attention occasioned by the devastating effects of the Ebola virus disease experienced in West Africa, particularly in the three most affected countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, as well as in other countries around the world. In Sierra Leone, many people lost their lives and gains made in the socioeconomic sectors were reversed, which resulted in the stagnation and near collapse of the economy. We were unprepared when the disease broke out and initial efforts to contain it proved futile because it was a new health phenomenon in the West African sub-region. We had neither the, technology, the technical capacity nor the requisite health infrastructure to effectively deal with it. In Sierra Leone alone, a total of 8,704 people were infected and 3,589 succumbed to the epidemic. Of this number, 221 healthcare workers, including 11 doctors, lost their lives. The outbreak of the disease in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia was a vivid reminder of the need for continued international partnership to contain the spread of, epi of epidemics worldwide. Such epidemic diseases represent a growing threat to human existence. The incidence of community afflictions caused by epidemics of varying types is becoming worrisome. What became known as Ebola, and, and, um, which escalated into full-blown epidemic in the Mano River Basin, was initially construed as a mysterious disease. By the time the disease was formally recognized as Ebola, on the 21st of March 2014, it had taken a huge toll on these communities. Similarly, the Zika virus disease, uh, the Zika virus, which was first diagnosed in Brazil in 2015, quickly spread to other countries with discomforting rapidity and uh, continues to present a serious threat. Madam Moderator, the overarching objective of this event is therefore primarily focused on sustaining the momentum of attention and awareness of the long-term recovery priorities and resilience of populations suffering from the after effects of health epidemics that have plagued countries in the West African sub-region and other parts of the world. It is against this background that these diverse panelists have been put together to highlight and discuss the rationale for continuous engagement in mitigating and addressing the long-term recovery priorities of communities afflicted by epidemics. Thank you. Said perfectly, we really acknowledge and appreciate Sierra Leone's uh, efforts. Um, I, having been there, there was a strategy that was already written. I know there's a lot of efforts to put that in, in, in place. Uh, so thank you so much for your leadership about this. Many countries came to the aid of West Africa in that very dark time. Uh, you will hear from many of them. Amongst the first was Botswana. Highly significantly, Botswana is reviewing its outdated Mental Disorders Act to protect the rights of persons with mental challenges and to improve mental health services. So the floor is yours, Ambassador, the Permanent Representative of the Republic of Botswana to the United Nations, Charles. And Twa Hai. Uh, you want to come here? Uh, you want to come here to the? You want to sit there? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, Botswana is pleased to be part of today's event. And we are very pleased to have co-sponsored this event alongside the sister missions of Sierra Leone, Canada, China, Cuba, France, Germany, Guinea, and Morocco. 
I also wish to take this opportunity to acknowledge the presence of the co-organizer organizations, namely the World Health Organization, UNICEF, CISAF from Liberia, the United African Congress, the International Association of Applied Psychology, the Psychology Coalition of NGOs that are accredited to the United Nations for having partnered with us in, in this event. Um, Madam Chair and the coordinator of this event, the theme for this event, which I do not need to repeat, is most pertinent and also very timely considering that we are in the midst of the implementation of the global agendas, both Global Agenda 2030 and for Africa, Global Agenda 2063. It's very, very important exactly. that we should be having uh, this event here today at this point in time. Um, and this particular theme, Madam Chair, is also in line with one of the uh, cardinal points of our foreign policy, which is mainly to respond to humanitarian appeals, international humanitarian appeals, particularly in times of epidemics and disasters. Though we are also not a very well-resourced country, it was a, we found it fit that, um, again, in line with our compassionate nature, we responded quite early uh, after the international humanitarian appeal which was launched following the outbreak of uh, Ebola in the three Western African countries of Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And we are proud to have been one of the very first uh, countries to respond. And uh, we, because of the contribution we made, uh, and I must also commend the three African countries concerned for their resilience. Um, they, they, they did an, uh, fairly well in terms of their response. And uh, like you have just rightly pointed out, um, Madam Moderator, there is linkage and synergy between the three uh, uh, development goals, one, three, four, and five. And I'm pleased that Botswana has significantly reduced the proportion of our population which is living uh, um, in poverty uh, below $1.25 a day. And we have significantly done this. And um, I would want to say that we are gratified that, as you have rightly pointed out, we have in the process of revising our Mental Disorders Act uh, in order to ensure that uh, we continue to provide quality mental health care. Um, in conclusion, since we are short of time, I want to again reiterate our commitment to working with sister countries in order to uh, realize the objectives of uh, the global agendas, both Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2063. And thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for making that circular connection there so beautifully and for all the accomplishments that Botswana is doing and making the connection between the Agenda 2030 that we have and the Agenda for Africa 2063. That's looking ahead, certainly. Um, uh, that's wonderful. Many places in the world that I've been also, I have seen teams of uh, Chinese medical workers who have come to a hum for humanitarian aid um, in many countries. They've certainly, China has had its own share of disasters between the earthquakes. Uh, Wen Chen, the great um, disaster there in Yushu, where I was um, a few years ago as well. China has also been through SARS um, and uh, other viruses. Um, that has really given them a, a great deal of experience in this particular issue. And so we are very honored to have the ambassador of China to the United Nations, who has just arrived last Thursday, so welcome, um, who is here to share with us um, his, his thoughts about that. Ambassador Ma Xiaoxu, welcome. of Ebola and efforts made by all the parties concerned 
in this regard. So forgive me to speak in Chinese, you know, in the following text. In 2014, the Ebola epidemic ravaged Sierra Leone, Guinea, Liberia, and other West African countries, which severely threatened people's life and caused huge losses to local economic and social development. At that critical moment, the international community showed solidarity and extended a helping hand to West Africa. Together, we won the hard battle against Ebola. To avoid the tragedy from recurring, the international community must draw lessons from our experience and comprehensively reevaluate that crisis from a historical and development perspective. It is therefore comparative, imperative to hold today's meeting, and it is highly relevant. So per the request of Judy, I would like to, based on China's participation in the combat and recovery, share the following observations. Firstly, we need to foster a community with a shared future for mankind and continue to support the recovery of West Africa. Global challenges such as the outbreak of infectious diseases call for global response. No country can stay immune. All parties must uphold multilateralism, support the UN's role as the central coordinator, and strengthen solidarity and collaboration. In our case, we need to continue our support for the recovery of the affected West African countries, fully mobilize civil societies and local communities, and help build resilience and the capacity to generate their own blood. Secondly, we need to apply systems thinking and take a holistic approach. We should make overall plans by taking into consideration prevention, treatment, recovery, and all other aspects, and assist West African countries in building a full-fledged medical and health care system, as well as a system for infectious disease prevention and control. While increasing investment in the hardware, such as hospital and laboratory, we need to also upgrade software by raising awareness, improving contingency mechanisms, and offering psychological counseling. Thirdly, we need to cement the foundation for recovery by supporting Africa's development. Economic and social development is the foundation and guarantee of recovery. The international community should help African countries implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the African Union Agenda 2063 by eradicating poverty, promoting education, public health, and employment, as well as enhancing infrastructure and interconnectivity, so as to make sure that African countries can deal with various challenges rapidly and efficiently. China and Africa are good brothers, good friends, and good partners who have supported each other in trying times. Since 1963, China has sent over 20,000 medical workers who have provided services to 280 million people in 51 African countries. During the Ebola outbreak, China sent nearly 1,200 medical workers to fight side by side with African people in the Ebola afflicted areas and provided nearly 900 million RMB in emergency cash and material aid, in addition to a biosafety level three mobile laboratory for Sierra Leone. In the post-Ebola era, China has trained nearly 100 public health officials and professionals for Africa, and has been helping Africa improve its public health system, including Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. China is also assisting Sierra Leone in building a West Africa Tropical Diseases Prevention Research Center and supporting West African countries in their economic and social recovery. At the end of the 2015, the Chinese President Xi Jinping attended the Johannesburg Summit of FOCAC. He announced the 10 cooperation plans, which entails practical cooperation on poverty reduction, people's well-being, public health, and infrastructure. China has provided 60 billion U.S. dollars of funding support. Later this year, as we will host the Beijing summit of FOCAC, China and Africa will discuss the future plans, draw a blueprint for our cooperation in the new era, and strive for win-win cooperation and common development at a higher level. Last, I would like to wish this side event a huge success. Thank you. Xie Xie, that was a wonderful, really 
beginning of your illustrious career to come here at the United Nations, so welcome. <laughs> Delighted to have you. And thank you for mentioning about brothers and sisters in Africa. They always talk about each other as brothers and sisters, but obviously we're all here brothers and sisters. And thank you for bringing out about uh, mental health as well as uh, the health crisis. Um, that's wonderful. So everywhere where I go also, I see uh, Cuban medical personnel, doctors and nurses. So thank you to Cuba for responding to so many crises. Uh, the former WHO director, Margaret Chan, who many of you know, said Cuba is world famous for its ability to train outstanding doctors and nurses, uh, which started, of course, after their own earthquake in 1960. Cuba's very committed to deploying doctors in many crisis zones. They sent more than 50,000 healthcare workers from Cuba um, all over the world, and certainly I saw them uh, in many places where I was. So thank you very much and welcome to the permanent representative of Cuba, uh, Mrs. Anayasi Rodriguez Camejo. Welcome. Dr. Judy, you are one of the few persons that pronounce my name perfectly well, <laughs> including my last names, the two of them. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Judy Kuriansky, distinguished ambassador, permanent representatives, uh, other colleagues, representatives of the international organizations. The international cooperation developed by Cuba in terms of humanitarian assistance for epidemic disaster relief is a modality that responds to the fundamental principles of our national health care system and our foreign policy, whose key pillars are internationalism, humanism, and solidarity. The fight against Ebola can be described as the most dangerous and altruistic mission we have carried out in more than 55 years of international medical collaboration given the characteristics of this highly contagious and lethal disease. However, upon the request for assistance made to our government by the, at that time, Secretary General of the United Nations, Dr. Margaret Chan, Director General of the World Health Organization, and the affected countries, we immediately, immediately, decided to participate in this global effort under the coordination of WHO based on our experience, readiness, and capacity to mobilize in a prompt and organized manner a large number of health professionals specialized in emergency health care. From October 2014 to May 2015, Cuban medical brigades worked ininterruptedly in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia for almost seven months. They dealt directly with the sick and also carried out preventive actions in, commun in communities until the outbreak was controlled. A total of 262 doctors and nurses were involved in a permanent way, selected among over 5,000 who volunteered in our country. They were joined by the Cuban diplomatic personnel accredited in these three countries to support political and logistic arrangements with the authorities of the countries concerned. We are honored, in fact, to have in our mission to right now in New York two of the diplomatic officers who were serving with the medical brigades in those countries at that time. They are here. Just raise, raise uh, your hand. One where, of them is there. Where? Rolando. Can you stand up? Will you stand up, please? Rolando was in, in, in Liberia, in Liberia, and Roberto was in, in Sierra Leone. A total of 2,167 cases were treated. Our collaborators also trained doctors and nurses from other countries and humanitarian organizations. There were only two human losses of Cuban collaborators who became infected with malaria and only one who got sick with Ebola, Dr. Felix Baez Sarria, whose life, whose life, by the way, was saved thanks to international cooperation of many of the countries that are here. And he came back to resume his mission in 
Sierra Leona when he, his health was recovered. Our main contribution to the, prevention, to the prevention of the disease and the achievement of resilience, not only in the affected countries but in other nations of the continent, has been keeping Cuban medical brigades in Africa. With over 3,000 collaborators currently working in 28 countries, mainly in primary health care. On this basis, a training program has been developed which includes prevention, community education, diagnosis, and treatment of these and other communicable diseases. We could say much more about this beautiful page of cooperation, one of many that we have accomplished to pay, our, uh, to pay off our historical debt to Africa. But time, we know, is limited. Um, let me just finalize expressing on behalf of my government our sincere gratitude for having been invited to this event as co-sponsors. It is not only a duty and an honor, but always a pleasure to share our views, dreams, and hopes with our African brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. Wow. <clears throat> And we can see now why you, Cuba has earned the uh, phrase Cuban medical internationalism. Well deserved, and thank you so much for everything that you've just said about your, your response. Uh, France, of course, came to the aid of Guinea, as France has come to the aid in many situations of which we're tremendously appreciative. The permanent representative of France, uh, Francois Delattre, um, up next to speak, and I've heard him speak many times in many places about so many different issues. France is committed to health care, to peace, uh, to the list of all our sustainable development goals. I've heard him speak about anti-terrorism, of course, disasters, anti-terrorism, and health the epidemics, they're all require the same kind of response, and he speaks so eloquently about that. Um, Ambassador Delatro, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Excellencies, chers amis, dear friends. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the permanent mission of Sierra Leone for this initiative and for organizing this event, as well as the other co-sponsors, with a special word of thanks to Dr. Judy Kuriansky, not only for her kind introduction, who makes me blush a bit, <laughs> but also for uh, your commitment, uh, Judy, you are one of these persons to whom we simply cannot say no. So whatever you do, uh, we are with you. That's uh, very sweet. Charmant. Les Français, c'est charmant. <laughs> actually, it's, it's a great honor for uh, the mission's uh, health counselor, uh, Ayad Zegar, and for me to be here with you on this very important uh, occasion as we try to draw together the lessons of the... Uh, Ebola uh, tragedy. And here let me uh, start by uh, saying that the victims and all those who continue to endure the consequences of uh, this tragedy are more than ever in, in our thoughts. Uh, while countries discuss strategies this week for eradicating poverty in order to achieve sustainable development for all, this event is very special indeed and very important because it gives us the opportunity to reflect on the Ebola crisis and the lessons learned from, from it. One of these lessons, among many others, of course, I believe, is that Ebola showed us that health epidemics go beyond health systems, that they have long-lasting and far-reaching consequences on societies and countries as a whole. I think it was well, one of the messages also from those who spoke be, before me. And conversely, fostering social development and eradicating poverty are critical to building robust and resilient health systems, and also to ensuring that a crisis as severe as Ebola does not happen again. Ensuring sustainable health, well-being, and education are indeed critical to achieving poverty eradication. 
And this event today and future discussions that we'll have together are an important step, I believe, in, in this direction. Ebola in West Africa might be behind us, but France, among many other countries, of course, continues and will continue to be present in the affected countries and more broadly elsewhere in the world. Indeed, a crisis is not necessarily over because it has been declared so. Uh, the recovery and reconstruction of health systems and efforts to address the uh, social and economic impacts of a crisis are absolutely uh, essential. And we all know it takes time and requires a sustainable, durable commitment. In the aftermath of the tragedy, uh, it was important and it is important to think about a new model for global health uh, security. In this respect, France supports WHO as a guarantor of global <laughs> health security and the use of its reference tool, the international health regulations. We also support the WHO Health Emergencies Program and the WHO five-year global strategic plan to improve public health preparedness and response. Dear friends, the best way to avoid a public health emergency is indeed to anticipate it. And building resilient health systems that integrate global health security is the best way to do it and to allow the prevention and mitigation of crises and their consequences. <coughs> Easier said than done, of course. I think that's the whole issue, the whole goal of this very meeting. Therefore, France would like to highlight and recognize the work of the WHO office in Lyon, France, which plays a key role in the prevention of health crises, which is in a large, to a large extent dedicated to this. France believes that public health emergencies cannot be restricted to epidemics. Other emergencies, such as natural disasters, also have a health, social, and economic impact, of course. And therefore, it is logical for us to promote the One Health concept, the aim of which is to integrate human health, of course, animal health, and environmental management in order to improve health security. <coughs> this global approach, it seems to us, is absolutely needed here. Building on all these concepts and experiences, of course, France released its global health strategy last year the two first areas of focus, which are interconnected, are dedicated respectively to health systems strengthening towards universal health, health coverage and to global health security, both. In line with this strategy, France is financing projects aimed at implementing and strengthening international health regulations core capacities, predominantly in Africa and Asia, these projects are always based on a One Health approach. Our operational agencies, such as Expertise France, the French Development Agency, France Veterinary International, and our research agencies are very committed and play a key role, as you know, in supporting these uh, projects. But again, it's a sustainable, durable effort that needs to be done here. We are convinced that communities absolutely need to be involved in these projects and that actually it is up to them to define how to take action with respect to their own health. France is also convinced that social science input is key to adapting these projects to local context and that's one of the key to success. In conclusion, we uh, as France believe that we will only be able to establish robust and resilient health systems and protect our populations through a shared uh, set of priorities, but also and more broadly through a commonly agreed uh, agenda. This is, I believe, our common uh, moral and uh, political responsibility. Uh, the presence here today of such an inspiring and diverse and committed group of individuals and experts gives us hope and certainly gives me hope that these lessons will be put to good use and that our discussions 
will be fruitful and will lead to concrete progress on the ground. So again, my warmer thanks to each and every one of you. Merci. Ah, merci. Bon, merci. We need to acknowledge France also for a very important step along with Thailand and Japan just recently in December passing the GA resolution on universal health care. This is absolutely major and we will all be committed to seeing that through and Fatima from WHO will talk more about that later. Uh, Germany has also greatly been supportive and responded in the Ebola crisis. A UN health worker was infected with Ebola and died in Germany. Besides that, um, medical services across Europe were on high alert uh, for preventing any of the risk of Ebola spreading. Uh, but in a hospital in Frankfurt, Germany agreed to accept an infected patient for treatment, which I think was just a tremendous step of appreciation and acknowledgement and, and courage. And so uh, the permanent representative of Germany, Christoph Hoiskin, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, it's a bit uh, disadvantaged that Germany in the alphabet is behind France, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe next time we can use the French alphabet, so l'Allemagne ah, would be... <laughs> bon. <laughs> Allemand. You would be first as Allemand even before Botswana. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was, it's a pleasure for, for Germany to, to co-sponsor the event, but the special thanks goes to you, Judy, and to the Ambassador of Sierra Leone, who are the driving force behind the, behind the event today. Um, Ebola certainly put health again on the international agenda. Um, it was not the first um, pandemic. Um, maybe it's not the last one, but what in any case um, is very clear, and we see this also with today's events, that after <laughs> Ebola happened and after um, the problems on the, on the spot was resolved, um, we didn't go back to business as usual. But the event like today shows that this stayed on the, on the agenda. Um, Germany tried to contribute um, to the um, at the moment of the crisis, um, we had people on the ground. We also um, engaged in logistics, and actually what we did was also then transporting people from the region into um, hospitals, and um, we have also set up um, instruments at our disposal in the long run. Then when these crises occur again, we have these airplanes that can transport people um, uh, out, of, out of the region. Yes, you did. So, we tried to commit um, in the region. The Chancellor personally was very much affected um, by what happened. We had a special envoy for this. We, um, the Chancellor went to Geneva to talk to um, the WO Assembly, to um, the um, Director General of the, um, what's the title, of the World Health Organization. And then we had last year the G20 presidency. And we put health as an item on the agenda of the G20, and for the first time in the G20, I believe for the first time in the G20 history, we also had a G20 health <laughs> ministers meeting where actually these questions were put on the, on the agenda. So um, it is clear um, no development without health, no health without development, or Judy put this much more sophisticated in the SDGs that you said. I said it more simple. You said it clear how the different SDGs <laughs> depend one on, on, on the other. Um, on, on lessons draw, to, to be drawn, um, only a few elements, and I think many of this have been mentioned before. First, we need a quick response, quick information. One of the problems we have is, and we found this in this case as well, then when you have the first sign, you see this may be something bad happening, countries may be reluctant to actually inform about it because they are afraid if they inform about a pandemic, then there are no more tourists, no business, and this could be detriment. We have to overcome that. And of course, we only can overcome that if we have then a system set up that copes with these, um, with these um, um, challenges. So we have to have good coordination in the country, in the region, and, and internationally. And then, of course, we have to go to conflict or to prevention. At, uh, as a um, Chinese colleague just uh, said it in his um, intervention, we have to have a holistic approach to this. Um, and um, it starts 
at the community level. And there I totally agree with fr what Francois said. We have to start at the community level. Also in the film we saw, um, the communities have to be made resilient. Um, they have to be educated. Of course, we have to, to look at the local um, cultural and religious aspects, but um, there again, it comes together with education, so we have to do that. Um, and then we, we need to, to um, of course, again, as Francois said, we, this has to be a sustainable, sustained commitment, commitment in the countries, commitment at the international organizations, and, and Germany also contributed to the World Health Organization's emergency fund. I think we are even the largest um, um, donor, at least this is what my notes say. Um, we are having... Now, I, uh, I saw the stats. You, you, you made a big donation. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So we have to support that. We have to support the individual governments, and we are supporting um, to a large amount the, the three affected countries, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and, and Liberia. And then there's one aspect, and I want to, to, to finish with that. We also have to get business involved. There's business interest. Our affected business have to be drawn. So what we also tried with um, in our G20 presidencies is to get business involved, in particular insurance, big insurance companies who have to get involved to see if they can uh, help uh, uh, cope with the problem. So thank you very much for, in, for including Germany here. Wonderful. Well, uh You, you've mentioned all the buzzwords. You were worried about France, but you know, you said holistic, community, cultural and religious factors, sustainability, getting the private sector involved, insurance. So there's a whole package. That's fantastic. Okay, that's all the things we need to do. <laughs> we're also delighted to have the permanent ambassador of Morocco uh, with us, um, Ambassador Omar Halal. Welcome, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm Omar Kadiri, the DPR of Morocco. Uh, oh. Ambassador Omar Hilal would have wished to be here, but uh, he's out of New York, so I'm here to, to, to replace him. And we are delighted as a permanent mission of Morocco to be one of the co-sponsors uh, of this uh, very important event. We thank Sierra Leone, we thank all the organizations, the, the organizers for, uh, for, for, having this, uh, for holding this important meeting, which uh, sheds a light on one of the most serious disease outbreak in, 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 in the history of, of, in the history, and who still has, and that is very important, if Ebola has been dealt with, we still have the effects of the outbreak now on the, especially on the affected countries. And that's, that's very important to keep in mind. Actually, the magnitude of this epidemic outbreak uh, in West Africa, especially Sierra Leone, in the brotherly countries of Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea, and, and, and Liberia, had unprecedented scope uh, due to its fast geographical spread, the number of deaths caused by the virus, and the socio-economic impact on the ground. Uh, Morocco, who, who entertains very strong ties and very uh, brother relations with this uh, with these countries as well as in other countries in West Africa and on the African continent was deeply concerned since the start of this, uh, of this, um, of this outbreak and was very concerned by the adverse effects of isolating Ebola affected countries. So in complete solidarity on, uh, with, with them, uh, Morocco has decided upon instructions of His Majesty the King Mohammed VI to break the isolation and maintain its airline services through Royal Air Maroc to these three countries. I believe that uh, Royal Air Maroc was the only uh, uh, airline that kept and never stopped its, 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 uh, its flights to these uh, three countries. Actually, uh, the um, uh, Royal Air Maroc kept three flights per week to Liberia, four flights to Sierra Leone, and seven to Guinea during the, uh, during the outbreak. Uh, also, uh, Morocco decided to use this to charter special flights to transport international humanitarian aid to the affected uh, countries, um, as convinced that this is one of the main ways to, to deal with the, the spread. Also, uh, and this is something that uh, Morocco entertains with these countries. Morocco has also cooperation, development, and, and uh, assistance programs with the three countries, and they were maintained throughout the, the outbreak, and we're continuing to do that. Um, I'd like to, to raise one issue because this, this, uh, the, the Ebola outbreak was not only a health crisis. It's, it's has a, it, is a, it was a multifaceted crisis with deep economic development 
and uh, social impacts on the countries. I'll give just a few examples. Uh, it's caused general stagnation in growth, in growth and profound fall in household income. It's uh, affected the investment, trade, transport services, infrastructures, food production, mining, employment, and schools. It's also had a negative impact on the economic activity, which cost the three countries billions of dollars in their gross domestic products. It also had a dispro uh, disproportionate impact on the elderly, the poor, and people with chronic illness and disability, as well as on the health and education systems. Uh, finally, and uh, last but not least, it has a psychological impact on people, especially children, since thousands of them are living today through the deaths of their family members or their mothers uh, and, and other family members. So um, from here, I want to, to, to pay very high tribute to the three countries for all uh, the efforts and for their commitments and for their uh, for their uh, for for their um, all the programs that they made to overcome the consequences of the outbreak, but at the same time, and this is something one point that I want to to to, to insist upon. It came up in some of the discussions, but I want to insist upon the international community must not forget about the aggravated impact Ebola has had on the affected countries. There is a lot that remains to be addressed in order to sustain resilience of these countries, who, as I said, have made tremendous efforts. Uh, the, the, the three countries need continuous support for the implementation of their strategies uh, to achieve their long-term sustainable development agenda. A steadfast and unwavering support provided by the international community, including us countries, but also uh, the uh, international system, international agencies, and uh, UN agencies, is very important to help them tackle the long-term socioeconomic impacts of the crisis. And here there is a call on the international community to continue that. And from our part, Morocco will definitely continue as it has done uh, uh, for a long time. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, I, I thank all the colleagues. When I see what every country has done, I'm really very impressed. And uh, so I thank everybody for that. Thank you. Thank you for building on this issue of the economics uh, with Ebola. It was called Ebolanomics because of all the integration of the social system and the economic system and already being a fragile situation. So that's very important to highlight. Um, we turn to Canada now and the Deputy Permanent Representative, Ambassador Louise uh, Blay. And so Canada, of course, has been a leader in many ways in many uh, issues here at the UN and particularly with regard to Target 3.4 and mental health and well-being. The Prime Minister is very supportive of this. The Finance Minister has made a statement at the World Bank WHO meeting not too long ago about their commitment. Uh, DPR Michael Grant is very involved, as the PR uh, Mark uh, Blanchard has been at many of our events um, at the UN about this. And so we're delighted to have you, Ambassador, you have the floor. Dr. Kuriansky, thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so pleased to appear alongside uh, such wonderful nine co-sponsoring uh, countries. Thank you to Sierra Leone for hosting, organizing this event. Uh, we're very delighted to be here under your leadership. Thank you so much. I also, before I make very brief remarks, because I think we really want to also hear about uh, from the panel today, uh, I want to just highlight the fact that in the room are some wonderful, bright, young students from, uh, from McGill University, my alma mater. Yeah. So thank you for being here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're the future, so very delighted that you're learning from the past, and this is what we're doing a little bit today. Um, the Ebola crisis di deeply impacted Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. From the early stages of this crisis, through the staggering mortality rates from the virus that we eventually saw, it was clear that we were dealing with a worst case scenario. Success in addressing the spread of the virus was due to the tireless work of the medical professionals that were on the front lines, the governments who led the response, and the support of the international community. And I think as my colleague from Morocco said, it's very impressive to hear today, even some of the things that us who were aware of, of the international intervention, um, it's really quite impressive to see what all the different countries who are here today uh, were able to bring to bear to this incredible uh, tragedy. 
Canada did, did its part, both on the ground and also back in labs in Canada. Uh, Canadian scientists, many of you will know, uh, played an important role in developing the ZMAP, uh, the antiviral treatment, and uh, were on the ground also to change attitudes. We were thanked not too long ago, I personally was thanked as Consul General by the CDC in Atlanta for the role that our French speakers, French Canadian speakers, played on the ground and working uh, with, uh, with uh, the communities. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that today's conversation is so clearly grounded in the sustainable development goals. Holistic approaches, and you were mentioning that earlier, all the buzzwords, but uh, the buzzwords carry a lot of meaning. Um, this holistic approach uh, based multi-stakeholder partnership is what is really going to bring us uh, to, uh, to the sustainable uh, goals and to Agenda 2030. Uh, the SDGs offer us this important roadmap uh, to achieve this and we must, we must follow it together in partnership. Coming back to the Ebola crisis more specifically, it was the community level reaction and the resilience that helped really succumb, that helped really uh, face the crisis and, um, but that resilience and that community engagement also left scars. Um, and they continue to be felt. I, um, I think when we talk about mental health, we have to make sure that we uh, take away the stigma. We heard in this video a lot of very strong men talk about it, and I can just only imagine what it would have been like for them to face the camera and as, 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 as strong men would survive a crisis to admit that they're still suffering from the emotional and mental uh, scars. I think we need to devise plans that will help accompany those populations post-crisis into uh, dealing with those uh, with those um, uh, lingering effects. I have been and continue to be a strong advocate of mental health in my own government. Uh, I think many of us who are involved in foreign affairs know the impact. We as governments and as employers have to also take care of our own people and those that are going out there in the front lines dealing with those crises. Um, you can continue to count on our support uh, and Canada's voice in advocating, as you so rightly said, through the leadership of our Prime Minister um, in advocating for the capaci uh, capacity building, the sharing of lessons learned, and the new approaches that will ultimately support those affected. Um, so thank you very much. Merci encore. Nous sommes ravis d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. Ah, merci bien. Beautiful. Excellent. Magnifique. We do count on Canada very much and are exceptionally appreciative for all the major contribution, commitment, and leadership that Canada has taken um, in so many issues, and particularly with regard to mental health and psychosocial support and well-being. So thank you so much. Guinea. Guinea was greatly affected, as we know, and being a French country really, I think, needed so much more attention, so we are going to all, I think, pledge that from here on in. Uh, we're delighted to have the Chargé d'Affaires from the Permanent Mission of the Republic of Guinea to the United Nations, Francois Aboussouma. Uh, merci. Thank you, Judy. I thank you all, uh, Excellencies, di distinguished uh, guests, and uh, uh, my, uh, my chair now, <laughs> um, Ambassador Amadou. I would like to, to thank you for the opportunity given to my uh, delegation within the, the framework of this side event, uh, which is the, of a paramount uh, interest to, to my country in view to the topic under discussion, which uh, brings to mind the painful period endured during the Ebola health crisis, which lasted from 2014 to the start of uh, 2016. Uh, this is also the opportunity to thank many countries here uh, who supported us and uh, uh, who were with, uh, at our side during the health crisis. The Ebola virus disease which ravaged Guinea and also uh, the two other countries of uh, Sierra Leone and uh, Liberia brought to light the notorious weakness of the health system in general and particularly the epidemic monitoring system. It's again the backdrop of uh, this finding that uh, a roadmap for monitoring was developed 
and validated with all partners with a view to resolve the major weaknesses identified as well as to help strengthen the health system. To put the roadmap into operation, the country put in place an epidemic and catastrophe management structure named National Agency for Sanitary Security since 4th July 2016. The following, the following has already been achieved and is uh, in the process by the, this agency. The involvement of trained personnel in integrated disease monitoring and response, the strengthening of diagnostic capacity, a strong involvement of hospital structures in monitoring of the disease, the strengthen of health personnel by the recruitment and training of over 4,500 health workers in all categories since January, January uh, 2017, the involvement of the communities, the local the populations in the monitoring of the disease, and also the strengthening of the capacity to encounter, to counter response. The country, for, for this matter, the country created 38 epidemiologic, epidemiologic call treatment centers. And on the other hand, uh, with the support of partners, uh, support programs for orphans, widows, and victims have been put in place for their econ social economic integration. These programs need to be strengthened. In spite of the, these uh, achievements, it's important to note that a uh, certain number of challenges must be taken into account within the framework of a resilient and sustainable health system. Then uh, I would like, uh, therefore, here to make an appeal to hold the partners for a follow-up of efforts within the framework of strengthening the health system and the sensitization of the people in the, in the Mano River Basin, which unfortunately has become a zone for hemorrhagic diseases whose harmful effects could be limited in a significant manner. Before I hand my country through me, thank the entire international community, the UN agencies, the donors, the donor agencies without who we could not have achieved positive results against an epidemic whose sanitary, socio-economic consequences are enduring. I thank you. We have so much to get to. So, uh, so thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, we're going to go to a, hear some voices from the ground and then get to our panel. We are allowed to stay in this room till three, so I hope everybody's okay with, with that. We've gotten permission from that. So let's um, roll the tape and hear voices from the ground from the Ebola survivors group, some of whom you saw in the first video. Carmen Vallali, who's a um, Valley, who's a health um, and technical and mental health specialist who was on the ground and coordinated with UNICEF the pillar meetings that we had every week talking about what the plans were, mapping, and who's doing what where. Okay. Yeah, so uh, of course the, the Sierra Leone Association of Ebola Survivors in partnership for uh, Network for Children's in Need uh, these are all orphans affected by Ebola. So we are here to get their own part. We are here to get their own part of the story, you understand? And what they've gone through and what are they also requesting for? Because honestly, we know what they are going through. Like as it is, they need medical attention, they need um, care, their welfare, so that they can get proper integration. But there is one of them here, who is going yeah. to speak? Who is yeah. going to speak on their behalf? 
you know, um, to talk about some of these challenges and what they are going through as orphans affected by Ebola. Yeah, so, what's your name? Okay. Yeah, Masi. So, what you need you want from the government and the international community able to look at? At exactly which one they go through when you go around torture and killing. Are you the really ones for them to support us to get home to stay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have um, child headed homes, child headed families, and so those girls they are very difficult to manage due to uh, mental health or psychosocial issues we face because of now added responsibilities at a very tender age because of no one to care for them at very uh, tender age because they lack the needed care, health care and support they, 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 they would like to access. The only solution that I was highly in need of is a counselor. Somebody to sit in front of me and talk to me and, and, and encourage me. I am still coping up. I say, oh, what is going on with me? You know, because this incident is very, very terrible for me. I have lost my father, my mother, I have lost my wife, I have lost my two brothers. In the area of the psychosocial aspect, it's another silent area of attention from uh, the government that uh, we want the psychosocial area, we want it. I want it because normally there are times when I sit down, you know, thinking about all those that I have lost, you know, it, it's very, very burning. Uh, it, it, it's been a very, very burning issue for me. The orphans area is another silent area of attention from the government. You know, we have about 18 to 19,000 orphans, you know, affected orphans, and also we have the infected orphans. But really, we will also um, thank, thank, thank really um, the, the support and um, giving to the government through IFI. Yes, at least for, for, for our well being. But um, it's not really enough for us. It is the cataract, the joint pain, muscle pain, testicular pain, you know, um, palpitation, menstrual problems. Our sisters, they are not seeing their. Their, their period normally, the way how they, they, they used to see their period, and also they have um, erectile problems, you know, for we the male survivors, and also deafness, earless, uh, hearing problem. So with all these complications, we are we are looking forward to donor partners, to international organizations, for them really to, to, to come into our, into, our, into our rescue. The survivors of Ebola are going through serious traumatic Problems. Some lost all their relatives, some lost key relations. For that reason, a lot of things are going on with them. They suffer severe headaches, they have they have a visual impairment, they have stomach ache, and many of them cannot think for themselves. So for that reason, some of the children are out of school, the women are going through serious financial burdens. The men also find it difficult to cope. We have been providing psychosocial support for some of these survivors in the community. And we hope to have external support to be able to reach more people in the community because this disease took over Liberia. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Judy, and everybody in this event for giving us the opportunity to very briefly, I've been said, uh, explain what enabling access to mental health was and how we, the work has continued in Sierra Leone and very especially what have we learned from the Ebola response and later humanitarian settings in the area. Um, enabling access to mental health was a program that started in 2011, funded by the European Union. And uh, this program allowed us to focus on capacity building, awareness raising and advocacy across the country. Um, in capacity building we trained 20 only psychiatric nurses that the country has and also trained PHU staff to have the capacity to recognize and refer cases. 
awareness raising focuses all across the country in changing attitudes around mental health and advocacy created the Mental Health Coalition in Sierra Leone. To date, the most extraordinary group of advocates reminding everybody in country that mental health cannot be forgotten. Um, during the Ebola response, here, uh, enabling access was being implemented and then the Ebola uh, crisis happened. So what we did at that time is very quickly use what we had to provide the better response possible. Together with the government, we deployed the 20 nurses to all existing district hospitals and that allowed to have to create a mental health unit in each of the district hospitals, decentralizing the services in the country for the first time ever. The nurses then linked to all of the PFA, psychological first aid being done on the, on the Ebola response to all of the NGOs working in all of the districts. And that response was amazing. It was amazing because it took a long time for the international community and the national community to acknowledge that mental health and psychosocial support was essential in the Ebola response. But once this recognition happened, it actually supported ending, uh, ending the, the transmission of the virus because these nurses were Sierra Leoneans talking to Sierra Leonean colleagues, telling them this is real, you have to do this, you need to trust us. After the Ebola response, we uh, had the amazing change of having um, more funding available in the country. WHO for the first time established a person dedicated to mental health exclusively that supported the government. The creation of the Directorate of Mental Health within the Ministry of Health has been a key achievement uh, last year in 2017 and work continues. Um, these nurses and the coalition have had the capacity to respond very quickly with everything they learned during the Ebola response to the next humanitarian catastrophe of the country, which was the mudslide last year in August. And the response was immediate and fantastic. What I get from the team on the ground and what I get from the nurses with whom I keep very close contact is that they are overwhelmed. There can't be only 20 nurses in the country. There has to be more human resources and there has to be uh, medication available at all levels and much more training being done in psychological interventions. So um, those cases that don't require medication and require psychological support can receive it. So in a context where crisis happen and the whole region has been hit by war, by natural disasters, by epidemic uh, crises, we need to have the mental health and psychosocial support element sorted. And the only way of sorting it out is having very strong services in the country. Therefore, strengthen system in systems in the country to be able of providing a better response on a daily basis and next time a crisis happen. Thank you so much. We gotta dance together, dance together. Uh, model of psychosocial support is in this book, The Psychosocial Aspects of a Deadly Epidemic, What Ebola Has Taught Us About Holistic Healing, which some of you have and we will be giving out um, uh, at the end as long as they last. Um, many of the uh, panelists here that we're going to go to right now have contributed chapters in here, WHO, UNICEF, UN Women. Um, so Fatima Khan is here with us from WHO. She's the external relations officer and the expert about the Ebola crisis. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Dr. Judy. Thank you for giving me the floor, and thank you also to the permanent mission of Sierra Leone for organizing this event and also for the, to the co-sponsors who have been instrumental in the Ebola response and also um, as we move forward with the global health agenda. I'd also like to pay tribute to the people of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone who paid the highest price during the Ebola outbreak. And also without them, we wouldn't have been successful in the response. It was only when we reached the communities that we were able to turn the tide of the outbreak. So we have to remember that as we move forward. During my small experience in the Ebola response, it was quite heartening to see how quickly the international system came together especially when we want to. When we decide to act, we can be very quick about it. And um, as the other co-sponsors have mentioned, it was truly a multi-sectoral approach. We saw that the Ebola outbreak, though it was a health disaster to begin with, it had far-reaching effects. 
and uh, we saw that in the response, as speakers mentioned, there was uh, logistic support that was required also in communications and advocacy in all areas. And we also saw that the far-reaching effects were, are also more than health effects. We have learned from this experience and um, also that investing in preparedness and resilience is key. And when we move forward and dealt with other outbreaks, such as Zika, yellow fever, and the plague, we have seen good progress in both responding to such outbreaks and also our efforts in preparedness. Given the short time, I'm going to be fairly quick and I'll only focus on three points. First, as uh, other colleagues have mentioned, the SDGs really require a multi-sectoral approach if we're going to achieve them. The interlinkages thread throughout all 17 goals and a holistic approach is really not a luxury anymore, but it's a necessity. Today, we're looking at SDGs 1, 3, and 4, but it's clear that the same discussion can happen uh, when we look at other goals. So this, this is something I think that we've, we know very well in theory, and to putting it in practice is now where we stand, and so that might be a challenge as we move forward. Secondly, as other speakers noted, and as I mentioned earlier, the need for long-term resilience and recovery for communities of, and of health system is critically important. Practitioners have been making the case for years, and we have the data. According to our data, investment in SDG3 and universal health coverage would result in direct increases in health and well-being. We looked at 67 low- and middle-income countries for the period between 26 and 20, uh, 2016 and 2030, and the study projected major gains for the goals and targets for SDG3. For instance, 41 million ch child deaths could be averted, 21 million HIV AIDS infections can also be averted, 226 million people could have access to clean water by 2030. So we have evidence to show that this investment can really create long-term gains. And the third point that I want to raise is also how very much intertwined the first two points have to the human impact. And as I was looking at this book that you kindly passed out to all of us, in the introduction, it opens with a quote from a man that you met in Freetown, and it really just resonated. Um, and I quote from that, I lost my job because of this Ebola, and I have no money for my family. And that one sentence is so loaded with the very real and very complex impact disease outbreaks and other disasters <clears throat> natural man-made can really have on people. And it goes far beyond the disaster itself. And so this is just to you know, bring something home to us as we go forward. And then how we bring it all together for WHO, when Dr. Tedros came on board as WHO's Director General, he laid out five priorities for us. He, the first one is to ensure universal health coverage without falling into poverty, and also to reach people that may fall through the cracks in other circumstances, such as migrants and refugees. This is the foundation for achieving the health objectives of the SDGs and kind of is, is the overarching mm -hmm. goal for us as we move forward as an organization. And linked to that, we are also focusing on developing resilient and prepared health systems capable of preventing, monitoring, detecting, and responding to public health emergencies. Third, securing the health, dignity, and rights of women, children, and adolescents. Um, they're the cornerstone of our societies, as we know, and so we really need to put them at the forefront. Fourth, to advance mitigation and adaptation strategies for climate change and environmental change, as we see that there's major public health impacts in that area as well. And lastly, transforming ourselves as an organization into a more effective and transparent and accountable agency so that we can better serve um, the people. I'd just like to quickly wrap up by stressing that in order to make all of this to work, we really need a coherent approach to bridge this humanitarian development divide, which we've been talking about for many years, and now it's really time to do this. There are two pillars that are mutually beneficial, and they'll really bring us closer to achieving the SDGs, and most importantly, ensuring that the people that we serve aren't left behind. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Fatima. We look forward. We look forward to the universal health care uh, implementation, which is wonderful. UNICEF played a very important role everywhere around the world, taking care of children. Um, so we're delighted to have Ibrahim Sisse here, who is a child protection specialist with, with UNICEF. UNICEF hosted all the NGOs in Sierra Leone in the meetings, in the pillar meetings, and so they really played a coordination uh, role as well. So thank you.
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Judy. Of course, um, I'm a national from Sierra Leone, and I would like to also thank my government and, of course, the co-sponsors of this event. Um, this issue is very, very close to my heart because uh, in as much as I serve as uh, an expert working at, you know, for UNICEF at the uh, international level, I was deployed to uh, my home country to really provide um, the required support since I've been global focal point for emergencies uh, with specific reference uh, to child protection, uh, of the protection of children in emergencies. So I was there for a period of four months, no break, starting, from, I think I went there, I arrived on the 2nd of uh, January until the end of April um, of 2015. So it has been a very um, important journey for me. So when I saw the topic with regards to um, achieving poverty eradication by sustainable health and looking in terms of psychosocial support, I said, wow. The first issue basically that came to hand was psych uh, poverty itself is a psychosocial issue. Mm -hmm. So when I saw this, I said, with all the ramifications of Ebola, taking into account the manner in which it has really ravaged both the human capacity as well as the economies, it's just aggravated the situation to a, to a, to a, to a, a level which, of course, <clears throat> led to all systems being stretched and in some, in some uh, occasions, they even collapse. So when you look at, for instance, the data regarding uh, the Ebola victims, there were about 8,700 uh, uh, plus cases. Those who really succumbed to the um, uh, epidemic, well over 3,500. But with specific reference to children, we had over 11,000 children that were directly impacted as a result of the epidemic, and of which you have over 6,000 that were orphans. So my responsibility there, working alongside with the government, was to really work with the pillar which uh, was managed and coordinated by the Ministry of Social Welfare, Gender, and Children's Affairs, which constituted child protection, psychosocial uh, services, as well as gender. Mm -hmm. And I, I would practically say I, uh, I helped the government, one, for us to really come up with a very coherent response with regards to these particular three pillars, looking at it in terms of prevention, the response, and onto the recovery phase, mm -hmm. which of course transcended into uh, some important uh, initiatives that are even ongoing. Um, the first thing I would like to really look at here basically is when you look at the emotional and the psychosocial impacts of the Ebola epidemic, which has halted the growth that was really achieved, we really went down because we were, all, we are, we were having a two-digit growth uh, figure before the Ebola. As a result of the impact, it went down to one digit, and I think it was even less than 5% which really crippled the economy, and of course it had so many consequences and impacts. But I would like to really come forward by uh, stating some very important issues with regards to the consequences of Ebola, vis-a-vis -vis in terms of communities as well as children. One was the issue of grief and fear, with specific reference to the psycho, uh, psychosocial effects, whereby communi uh, community members we are able to share stories with me about the, the emotional changes that they've gone through, their inability to grieve due to the burial processes, and the uncertainty on how to move forward with life after the occurrence of Ebola. That was very, very uh, intriguing. And of course, the community was also adamant that the infectious disease events you know, will keep occurring and had a lingering pan, uh, Paronia in terms of uh, what life will be like. Because the issues in terms of what has really occurred, both at individual and community level, they were just too overwhelming. And then, of course, they cannot really cope with us. The second and important issue which I'd like to state was the collapse of the family and communities. But that is one significant issue, the issue of culture. Like, for instance, Dorian burials, uh, the, uh, 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 death robbed many individuals of their loved ones. Some community members reported tens of thousands of deaths that were attributed to Ebola. But the important thing, which is, of course, important to state here, is the cultural and the traditional practices 
that we are done when, uh, as a result uh, for the disposal of bodies. But of course, it's also created an issue wherein people got infected of the virus because of this particular practice that was, that was really carried out. But it has got an, Im uh, an implication with regards to the cultural rituals wherein people had to undertake in terms of mourning the dead and, of course, with, bur with burial. So they were denied those particular practices, and then it had very adverse you know, psychological effects on most of the community members. The third issue, the financial burden, which I will not dwell too much on, which of course I've talked about a loss, because in terms of loss of employment due to fear in terms of you know, bringing in people. And the fourth issue is the stigma of mental health. When you look in terms of the Mano River Basin, when you're talking about people and mental health or mental diseases, Mental health is perceived negatively uh, by the burden community. And we are in, when you talk about mental health, the association and the alignment of short consequences are so dire. So people don't really even want to talk about it. People don't even want to be associated with short -term, with short -term issue. But I would just like us to also look at, in as much as there have been some very difficult times, this also created uh, a positive impact with regards to how life has been at the household level. One, there was the, the closure of schools. But then there was an issue whereby government had to really institute um, uh, uh, learning through uh, electronic and uh, news media, wash hands, washing of hands, which was very, very important, um, really improve uh, household sanitation. And the fourth, the third, which I would like to add there, has been the issue with regards to FGM because this is also an issue that has got rights um, uh, uh, co uh, consequences with regards to the lives and health of uh, girls and women. So my time is up, but then I would just like to give three or four key recommendations. One, the cultural competencies with regards to looking at uh, health emergencies. It is very, very important for us to really look at this uh, primarily when you look at the cultural uh, issues that have been embedded within communities. The second, mental health resources. They are very, very um, limited, but then it's very, very significant for us to build those resources. The preparedness and recovery um, plans which government has got, I think that this is also a time for us to see how best we could contribute to those. And the last, which of course I will practically suggest, we do have the SDGs at our disposal and it's a matter for us to really rebuild and strengthen systems through multi-sectoral and integrated approaches so that we could have effective health systems, including social welfare sectors. Thank you. We, we appreciate your passion and leadership of, of UNICEF and your passion as a Sierra Leonean and, and a, a, a Liberian. We are very delighted to have with us from Liberia, Sam Suyian, uh, Suyian who is from Liberia and here with us and is a social worker who is continuing to work with Ebola survivors. Thank you so much, Sam, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Judy. Um, let me also state that uh, I believe many of the points have been stressed by most of the previous speakers. So I would basically just look at some few issues that may have not been mentioned just to reemphasize. Let me begin by setting the context that uh, in Liberia, the EVD virus infected over 10,000 persons and claimed the lives of over 4,000. We want to also join previous speakers to commend international organizations, governments of other countries for coming to our aid to bring this disease under control. I want to, on a personal level, say to our distinguished gentlemen from, Air, from Morocco uh, for mentioning about Air Morocco. I know many families who wanted to get out of the country but could not leave when major flights decided not to return to Liberia. From the beginning of the crisis and up to now, Air Morocco continues to fly. And on a personal level, I have committed to fly with Air Morocco only because of that gesture. We also remain grateful. I want to pay tribute to our community workers and the volunteers who put their lives at risk in order to address this epidemic. When they got involved into the crisis on the community level, this was a major turning point in controlling the disease. They came to the table 
with a lot of the cultural understanding that was going on in communities, some of which Dr. C.C. has mentioned, especially the burial practices, which most of our medical doctors and international partners did not understand. And so the cultural competence that was brought to this issue by the communities was very, very crucial in addressing the disease. The outbreak left over 11,000 survivors of the disease, many of whom now are reporting post-recovery symptoms, terms as post-Ebola syndrome. Many of these symptoms are very severe enough to require medical care and psychological care for months or even years to come. The victims who have become orphans and survivors, many of them are living in abject poverty due to the disease. Most of these survivors love their bread, lost their breadwinners, and many of them are either homeless or living with families that were unprepared to take on these responsibilities. In short, many of them have become invincible and suffering in silence. It seems as though when we immediately closed the emergency treatment units, we forgot about these victims and left them to fend on their own. Many of them see themselves as survivors and are making significant contribution to finding an understanding and cure to this disease. Presently in Liberia, we host one of the most larger clinical research or, or, or approach that has been sponsored by the National Institute of Health and is called the Prevail uh, Research Project, which is trying to understand the disease from a genetic approach and also from a medical approach. But I want to say that these victims or survivors, while they are contributing to understanding the disease from an evidence-based approach, they deserve to live in dignity and as human beings. And so there is a need to continue to provide psychological support and social economic support for these survivors. My organization caters to over 200 survivors, and uh, we've been doing this since 2015, and up to present, many of them still don't have the requisite uh, things that they need to survive. I want to close by sharing with you two interesting stories. One is about a boy named Bangali. Bangali is not only a survivor, he's also an orphan. He was taken to the emergency treatment unit by his both parents, mother and father, and the, both parents died in the NTU and Bangali survived. Presently, Bangali suffers from a kidney problem and is still not yet established whether that is due to the disease. But on a daily basis, his older sister, who is not his caregiver, has to struggle to take care of Bangali, both his medical condition and daily living. This is becoming difficult because Liberia does not have a dialysis treatment and also there is no uh, strong healthcare system. Finally, I want to join others that we hope this event will inspire all of us, especially governments and international partners, to renew their commitment and pledge to continue to support these Ebola orphans and survivors in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. With a final word, the legacy of this EVD, or the Ebola virus, can best be remembered for three things. Extreme poverty, dysfunctional healthcare system, and distrust of our government. But every time I talk about this disease and the impact it continues to have on various countries, and especially on Liberia, I'm reminded about a friend who said to me, and I quote, the medical care or the infrastructure health system of our country should never determine whether we live or we die. I thank you. Thank you for all your work that you're continuing to do in, in Liberia. A very good friend of mine, Dr. Mohammed Nur Hussein, I was in the forefront of raising awareness about Ebola. Uh, with his colleagues, uh, Gordon Tapper, uh, who's helped with this event, and also uh, Sadiq Wai, organized the, the forum early on in the epidemic and a major concert that was held in the GA Hall 
with the Secretary General there and many ambassadors, um, and also has a very unique program that I think is one of the uh, models that we can look to for uh, the African in 2063. Uh, so, Dr. Nur Hussein. for hosting this event. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I'm going to talk a few, uh, I'd like to spend the next few minutes to talk about the, what the diaspora Africans have been doing, especially in terms of the uh, Ebola, when it first hit the West African countries. Uh, there was initially a sort of an indifference that we thought uh, on the, in the global community to the uh, um, uh, significant, I mean, the, the severity of the epidemic. And we felt part of the reason was uh, lack of awareness, and we decided to hold a forum at the ECOSOC chamber uh, on May and uh, on August 27th, uh, 2014, by which time close to 1,000 people had died. And uh, the forum was uh, effective for why it was uh, intended. The ambassadors of the th uh, three uh, countries affected, uh, the Mano River Union countries, uh, participated and uh, made presentations. Uh, this was followed by, as uh, uh, Judy said, uh, by a concert, Stop Ebola and Build for the Future concert, uh, six months later. Uh, <clears throat> We had uh, in this uh, group of doctors and uh, uh, health, uh, uh, rather faith uh, leaders, uh, civil society leaders, city and state officials, and then, of course, uh, most of the diplomats accredited to the United Nations were in attendance, as were representatives of WHO and UNICEF. Um, we realized that part of the problem has been also that information was not disseminated in the culturally appropriate way uh, when uh, the, especially in the rural areas. Uh, we had uh, our contacts uh, on the ground, such as the Paramount Chief of Kanema, with whom uh, some of our members were in, uh, uh, in contact. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> We also raised some funds at the, at the time. Uh, a lot of doctors and nurses were dying for lack of proper personal protective equipment, for example, uh, especially in the initial days. In fact, one of the top experts on uh, Ebola uh, succumbed to the disease uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, Dr. Khan. And, and so uh, we kind of started uh, mobilizing uh, resources and we were able to send some uh, uh, support some some uh, supplies to the uh, to the affected countries. Uh, <clears throat> one of the problems at this time also we realized in the initial uh, intervention by the global community was the lack of cultural awareness, uh, not realizing the burial practices and uh, the idea about health and disease in the uh, belief systems <coughs> among the Africans, and uh, we realize that, for example, the uh, traditional healers who provide the primary care in rural areas could have been recruited early on uh, into the uh, information dissemination. Uh, some of the examples was, for example, that, that the uh, family members were told to incinerate the dead body of their families and so on, which was you know, medically uh, sound uh, as an advice, but, but culturally really very insensitive. And so there was uh, a reluctance or a resistance on the part of the rural areas. Um, in any case, that was, uh, you know, important to have had some cultural, and we learned something about that from this epidemic. Um, I will switch gears now to something that the diaspora has been doing also. Um, I am originally from Ethiopia, and uh, Model Initiative of Quality Medical Care in Africa, the example of Ethiopian American Doctors Group uh, uh, is something that I would like to touch on. Uh, 300 doctors, uh, Ethiopian doctors in the United States, uh, some also from Canada and Europe, uh, got together and invested in uh, what we hoped would be 
uh, a sort of uh, a center of excellence, um, economically sustainable hospital uh, to deliver uh, internationally accredited standard of care. Uh, the vision was that we would do that through education and research in the people of Africa, in, the, in Ethiopia and Africa, uh, which could be... Uh, uh, we managed uh, to get land from the government of Ethiopia and uh, about 150,000 square uh, meters, and uh, we actually uh, have already... Uh, started working on the foundation. So uh, we are very hopeful on that. Uh, so in the pr interest of time, I'll stop here. Uh, I just want to say one word about that. Uh, we, we have centers of excellence uh, of different services, but I would like you to concentrate on the last one, maternal and child uh, services, because that's an area where uh, Ethiopia, like many countries in Africa, we have the highest mortality of, of ma mothers. I remember the word of the for, uh, late Prime Minister of Ethiopia, uh, Mele Zenawi, who said it's an unacceptable that a mother should die while giving life. And so uh, it's going to be one of our centers of excellence in addition to the other. Uh, so we, um, I think this, we think this could be a model for uh, diaspora in the development and eradication uh, of poverty through education and health care. That's an excellent example for the diaspora to follow from the United African Congress. So I appreciate that. Uh, the, our representative um, for, to ECHOSOC from the International Association of Applied Psychology is going to quickly go through some other models in developed and developing countries. Uh, Dr. Walter Reichman. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank the mission of Sierra Leone to the UN for sponsoring this excellent and important side event and the other mission co-sponsors, panelists, and most of all, my magnificent colleague, Dr. Judy Koriansky, who courageously went to Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak to help psychological support for the people there, and who also contributed to securing mental health and well-being in the UN Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. This panel is making a very important connection between goal one, goals one and four, and target 3.4 of the SDGs about promoting mental health and well-being. As psychologists, we see this circle proven by research and in some very interesting and on-the-ground programs for which I will give examples in a few minutes. These examples come from the emerging field of humanitarian work psychology. We do research and develop programs addressing mental health, physical health, education and poverty reduction through methods of educational programs, teacher training, increasing literacy and job training integrated with mindset and life skills. We also add goal eight to this equation, which is of course to achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men, including for young people and persons with disabilities. On this last point, I direct you to the statement IAP submitted to ECHOSOC, posted on the Commission's website, and also handed out here. The title is Reducing Poverty by Employing Individuals and Disabil with Disabilities, Contributions of Psychological Research and Practice. Now I would like to give some concrete examples of programs aimed at improving the lives of the most vulnerable in developing and developed countries that can serve as models for other countries. The first example is an entrepreneur training program called Students Training for Entrepreneurial Prospects in Uganda. The training in the classroom and then the field training outside on small groups led to the starting of business within 18 months by 51% of the students coming out of the program as compared to a control group of only 30%. The second example is the Center for Creative Leadership that provides leadership psychological skills to adolescents in conflict zones in the Rift Valley in Kenya to redirect them from being recruited into gangs and tribal warfare. The results showed that the adolescents developed more confidence 
and a desire to build a community through cooperating with each other. The next example is the Girls Empowerment Program, co-developed by Dr. Koriansky and our IAP team in partnership with the First Lady of Lesotho and other NGOs. Village girls with leadership potential were brought to a camp where they learned entrepreneurial and life skills to avoid HIV AIDS, resist transactional sex for money, and raise their self-esteem. The research showed a positive outcome pro proving that the combination we are talking about on this panel, education, poverty, and well-being. Next, in a developed country, Great Britain developed a program that dealt with the homeless, that taught them positive self-concepts, recognizing their abilities, seeking, finding, and becoming successful in jobs, and thereby becoming productive workers. As applied psychologists, we are eager to partner with UN missions, UN agencies, and other NGOs to share our research and programs such as they are so we can improve the well-being of the people of this world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. In conclusion, the buzzwords that are important from this, co this entire event, a holistic approach involving the community, sensitive to cultural and religious issues, being sustainable, involving multi-stakeholders that we've had here, uh, I'm very uh, appreciative to the mission of Sierra Leone. I thank uh, Emma and, um, and Matthew, who's run all our video here, my students from Columbia University Teachers College, and all of you for caring about this, all the ambassadors who are here, WHO and UNICEF, and those of you on the ground, for uh, or what we've heard is that we need this partnership. We're going, we're going to move forward together uh, in this way. So thank you all for being here.